Good morning, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Diane Balkin, and I'm a senior staff attorney with Animal Legal Defense Fund's Criminal Justice Program. And I'd like to first echo what we heard in the previous um, presentation from Carolyn, who said mistreatment of animals is wrong in and of itself. No truer words could be spoken. And we talk about wrongs to animals. We need to include all types of animals, all classes, including but not limited to domestic animals, wild animals, working animals, exotics, companion, aquatic, and absolutely farmed animals. And that's why we are here today. It's an honor and a pleasure for me to be here to introduce you to the two presenters who are going to enlighten you about how we can use the cruelty laws to protect farmed animals. You're going to first hear from David Rosengard. Uh, David is a staff attorney with Animal Legal Defense Fund's Criminal Justice Program. He works to ensure that justice is done on behalf of animals and animal cruelty victims through law enforcement assistance, trial support, amicus briefs, legislative efforts, educational programs. Beyond his work with Animal Legal Defense Fund, David has worked on numerous various animal law books. He's published several articles dealing with the intersection between animal law and constitutional law. And on top of all of this, he teaches as an adjunct professor of animal law at his alma mater, Lewis and Clark Law School in Portland. You're also going to hear from John Hopkinson. He is an attorney based in Portland, Oregon, who recently spent three years working with the Investigations Department at the Oregon Humane Society. He'll be discussing his experiences investigating animal cruelty and neglect. He will also um, detail his experiences advocating for animals in the Oregon Legislative Assembly. They will enlighten you about how we can better use the existing cruelty laws to protect farmed animals. This is going to include the importance of appropriate legislation and zealous investigations and prosecution. And as a bit of a teaser, I'm going to let you know right now that we are very excited to unveil a first-of-its-kind tool for you to help you use the cruelty laws for farmed animals. Enjoy. Excellent. So I want to be mindful of our time. I want to make sure that we have the opportunity for questions and discussion at the end. So I'm going to move, as we say in the law, with due and deliberate speed. So, yes, there we are. Uh, so, to start off, some context. Um, I'm going to give you some broad theory. I'm going to talk about some broad issues, ways that we generally can use criminal law to protect farmed animals. Uh, John's going to walk you through some specific st case studies and applications of those principles. Uh, we're also going to avoid too many graphic images. Uh, at this point in the conference, you have seen a lot of those, but we are dealing with crimes against animals, and so there may be a few, and I give you that proviso now. So let's launch into some context for the issues that we're dealing with. Farmed animals in the law have a lengthy history. Uh, and you can see some of the many areas of the law where these issues are often implicated. And uh, the bovine you can see there is uh, a sculpture of a bull's head from uh, around 25,000 BCE. And this is notable because that's the era where we find probably one of the most famous and widely discussed examples of animals in the law, uh, and with due apologies to the fox in Pearson versus Post, this is actually the goring ox of Exodus 21-28, uh, all of which is simply to say that the intertwining of farmed animals and the law has followed us nearly throughout the entire history of humanity's conception of the law. With the rise of stable agrarian societies came Farming came law, and the two have never really separated since. So given that we have so many areas of the law that involve farmed animals, 
you know, religious law, tort law, contract law, property, environmental, and so forth, why are we here talking about animal law and criminal law together? Uh, ah, yes, there it is. Uh, well, I would suggest there are a few reasons why we're doing this and a few reasons why this session is going to be useful. Uh, and one of them that is most important is applying criminal law to animal law, looking at that intersection point, really underscores some of the unsupportable contradictions in terms of how we as a society view and interact with animals. Criminal codes at this point in time deal with animals as by and large sentient creatures who can experience pain, who can experience suffering, and who should be protected from that. Criminal codes also encompass a regime where animals are exposed to death and suffering for human benefit. And the more we look at that contradiction, the more we see how something needs to change, how there's a inherent incoherency there that it is the duty of us as attorneys to help suss out and render, render coherent, and the duty of us as a society to figure out how we want to deal with that. Uh, moreover, at the end of the day, when all is said and done, if we are talking about having laws that protect animals, those laws are going to need to involve a criminal component. Uh, we have yet to come up with a way to ensure uh, that the people who really want to do harm to others are in some way intervened and prevented from doing that harm or held accountable. And the last thing that I'd like to say about this is the intersection of animals and criminal law shines the light on animals as meaningful individuals. And it does so for a variety of reasons. One is at the basis of what criminal law is about. Criminal law is more than about holding someone accountable for harm. We have a variety of ways to do that. Tort law, for example, can do that. Criminal law is about society standing up and saying, this is not appropriate. This activity that causes harm is beyond what we are willing to tolerate as a society, as a body of law. Uh, and when we can say that about animals, we can, when we can say that unlawful animal cruelty is something we do not tolerate, that also means that we as a society are saying the individual animals who are the victims of that crime matter. And we as a society think they matter. And again, this is not always something we say coherently. It's not always something we say co consistently. But the more we work on these issues, the more strongly that message comes through. And ultimately, I would argue that comes through in a space of us recognizing that each of these individual incidents of cruelty connects to an individual animal crime victim and should result in justice accorded to that victim. Uh, so finally, that is all well and good, but can we actualize this? Uh, yes, we can. That's the good news. The rest of the news is it's going to be very complicated, and there are very real limits and challenges to doing this, and we're going to explore those during the rest of my talk. Uh, one thing I would like you to bear in mind, though, is that as we explore what the limits and challenges to using criminal law to protect farmed animals are, there are going to be ways we can even lean on those limits to give us leverage points that speak to expanding the position of animals within the law and protecting their interests. So to give us an idea of what kind of things we're talking about, let's move on to look at some animal cruelty statutes. Uh, and by and large here, we're going to be talking about state law. There is not much federal law to speak of that addresses animal cruelty, particularly in the farmed animal context. Uh, there's the Humane Method of Slaughter Act, which only applies to animals really at the moment of slaughter. There's the 28-hour law, which pertains to transporting animals for no more than 28 hours at a time in a conveyance. Uh, and really, it's more than 28 hours because you can get an exemption pretty easily. Uh, so largely, we're talking about state codes. And I'll give you two highly summarized examples. Uh, since we're here, and since it arguably has the best uh, cruelty statutes in the nation, let's look at Illinois. Uh, so Illinois defines animals as all non-human creatures, talks about the affirmative duty to provide animals with care, and it defines some of the ways in which one would commit cruelty to an animal. 
And uh, to give us a converse, we can look at Kentucky. Uh, animals are warm-blooded, non-human creatures, so already uh, the aquatic denizens of fish farms are out of luck in terms of using criminal law to protect them. Uh, we don't have the same sort of affirmative statement of duty to provide care, uh, and we have different sort of uh, construction for exemptions and what might constitute a violation. And a few things to bear in mind as we go forward, you'll see there's a justifiability piece there. Uh, that's going to come up quite frequently. We'll be talking about how that works in terms of building exceptions into the law. Uh, but one of the things before we get there that I encourage you to think about is how these elements of a statute really determine what kind of behavior you can hold people accountable for and what extra steps you may have to go through. So for example, if you've got a case where someone has starved their animals, allowed animals to become mal malnourished, not fed animals uh, that they were holding in a pasture, for example. Uh, if you were reading the materials associated with this presentation and you looked at state versus shot, uh, I'm actually talking about that case, we've got a variety of cows, they're in a pasture, they haven't been fed. If you were in Kentucky, that's not enough to get you animal cruelty. You will need to prove that the experience of not getting food causes physical pain or suffering. Uh, and while that might be intuitive to all of us in this, in this room, you may need more than that intuition to actually get a conviction. Uh, but we'll talk about what some of the things you might need are. So let's look specifically at what we mean in terms of farmed animals and the application of statute to them. Uh, so first, it's important to note that the scope of cruelty laws that protects farmed animals applies to what we would think of as standard or traditional, your sort of pop culture, classic animal cruelty issues. Beatings, burnings, uh, sexual assault of animals, and so forth. It also has additional implications for activities that happen within the farm setting. And I suspect that's what most of you in this room are here to talk about, think about, and discuss with us. Uh, and we'll get to that in a moment. Before we do, though, there are some additional implications regarding which animals we're talking about. Um, when we think about farmed animals, we have a tendency to think about classic farmed animals. Uh, and actually moving forward to the next slide, I'd argue that, uh, uh, yes, I'd argue that there's actually more going on than that. Uh, we could think of pigs, cows, chickens, and so forth. But if we think about animals in the context of being owned, bred, uh, and used to further the commercial interests of humans, that would apply to puppy mills, that would apply to fur farms, that would apply to a variety of operations. And a lot of the issues that we see when we discuss factory farming and animal cruelty laws are going to be equally applicable. Uh, so let's bear that in mind. I want to take a step back quickly. There we are. Um, so it's going to important, be important for us as we talk about these issues to distinguish between two kinds of conduct. Uh, conduct where the system is working as intended, where the cruelty involved, A, may be lawful, in which case it's outside the scope of what we're talking about, but even if unlawful, is precisely how the system is meant to work. And on the other hand, non-systemic cruelty, cruelty that falls outside the bounds of the way, at least in theory, the system is supposed to work. And that's going to implicate how easy or complicated it is to move prosecution forward. We're also going to look at who has exposure uh, for criminal liability. Uh, and there we're going to be examining mental state issues, uh, you know, how intentional was the act that someone took, how reckless was it if you allow your animals to starve, can you show that the defendant did that recklessly or did that intentionally? How much knowledge did they have? Uh, and a note that I want to make on sensing and charging, uh, particularly in light of the conversation we just had last panel, is uh, speaking for a moment as someone who does a lot of work on behalf of animal crime victims, speaking as it were as a animal crime victim uh, law attorney, uh, one of the sentences that is incredibly potent to look for is a possession ban on animals. Uh, if you have someone who is abusing animals in the course of their farming and they are no longer allowed to have animals, 
then they are no longer able to abuse animals in the context of farming. And that's a pretty great solution. Um, and for those of you worried about the carceral state, that's a solution you can get to without incarceration. Excellent. So we're going to move on. Uh, we've talked about substatutes for animals, don't count as animals, fish in Kentucky, uh, poultry under the Federal Humane Method of Slaughter Act. Uh, we'll now move on to talk about conduct, the perpetrators thereof. And this is where we really get to what kind of activity is happening and what can we do about it. So I want to take a moment for us to reflect on cruelty in the factory farm environment. I argue that there are a variety of reasons we see cruelty in that context. And one of the, particularly one of the reasons we see systemic cruelty, cruelty where the system is working as intended, has to do with the, efficient, the emphasis on efficiency in factory farms and the erasure of identity. And these apply to both the animals involved and the workers. So for those of you who saw Michelle Welsh's presentation yesterday, you may have remembered that she showed a video of a worker setting a giant transport crate down on a group of chickens. And her explanation, having gone through trial on that, was that the worker was doing that because it was easy, because he was in a hurry, because you're pressured to get things done very quickly in that kind of environment, and the individual birds don't matter. They're irreplaceable cogs in a machine that produces an end product, in this case, an end product of chicken flesh. That sort of context, that sort of paradigm, inevitably encourages harmful activity, encourages cruel activity, encourages harsh treatment of animals. Uh, certainly, we see that in other contexts. We see people uh, working in farms. We see people managing farms, encouraging profits over animal welfare. And we also see egregious cruelty. We see people harming animals because they're frustrated because the humans are working in wretched conditions and they're taking out their uh, work-related angst on a convenient victim. And we see violence against animals in those contexts for all the other reasons we see violence against animals anywhere else in society. Uh, there are a range of reasons why people engage in uh, antisocial or socially condoned violence. Uh, and again, factory farms are not immune to that. Now the rub, of course, to holding people responsible is getting around the exemptions written into the law. As you may recall, when we were looking at those statutes, there was discussion of nece necessity or justifiability. Is causing pain to an animal, is killing an animal justified or necessary? And this is really where the entire game happens. Uh, and typically justifiability or necessity is a jury question. Uh, as is cruelty, if cruelty is not otherwise defined in your code. If you have a statute that simply says it is a crime to be cruel to an animal and it does not tell you what cruelty means, that's typically going to be up to a jury to decide. Uh, and this poses a number of challenges. One is we don't know who to evaluate those terms in terms of. Do we evaluate necessity or justifiability from the standpoint of the farmer? from the standpoint of consumers, from the standpoint of the animals. And that last is not as radical a step as you might think. If we look back to cases as early as 1913 uh, in Waters v. Brathwaite, we see courts asking whether activity are justified from the animal's perspective. And in that case, and this is a United Kingdom case, so sadly a bit out of our jurisdiction in the States, uh, finding that that sort of justifiability couldn't simply hinge on making money. It had to involve some benefit to the animal. If you're interested in more on how exemptions work, for example, exemptions that go beyond justifiability and necessity to say that any sort of humane activity is per se not crime. So for example, a statute that says it is a crime to kill an animal unless you kill an animal in a humane way. Or it is a crime to cause an animal to suffer unless it is a normal animal husbandry practice. I recommend looking at New Jersey SPCA versus New Jersey Department of Agriculture. You can find it online in the resources for this panel. Uh, 
there's a lot going on in that case, and it hinges a lot on administrative law, but a few things to pull out of it are a recognition that common normative activities are not automatically humane activities, that regulatory capture in and of itself renders uh, standards of humaneness or husbandry vulnerable to being arbitrary and capricious. In that case, the New, York, the New Jersey Department of Agriculture simply left it up to the industry to figure out what was humane. And the court said that that doesn't really work. The industry has figured out that everything they do is humane. Now you have no standard. Uh, and finally, this kind of analysis forces a confrontation of what actually happens to animals in farm settings. It forces us as a society to say, these are the things that we've decided constitute criminal treatment of animals. And if we want to support a factory farming system where that behavior is inherent and unavoidable, where forced molting is inherent and unavoidable, where gestation crates are inherent and unavoidable, and so forth, we need to be willing to stand up as a, as a society and say, that's what we stand for. And if we're not willing to do that, we need to be prepared to change the way farming happens. And this ties into many of the conversations we had yesterday in terms of forcing industry to bear the true costs of its behavior, to accurately portray what it's doing, and at the very minimum, live up to its own promises, and thereby evening the playing field between plant-based and flesh-based meat and protein products. Uh, a few other notions on exemptions that are worth thinking about. Uh, you'll see them phrased differently in pretty much every different state. And they range widely in terms of how friendly and useful they will be to you in pursuing justice for harmed animals. In Pennsylvania, for example, any normal activity that farmers engage in year after year in production and preparation of poultry and livestock or their products is per se not criminal. So that, that's difficult. Uh, I suppose you'd have to figure out what you, how many years were involved, uh, but it puts a lot of ability, uh, a lot of power in the hands of the industry to exempt their behavior from activity. In contrast, in Wisconsin, if we're looking at sheltering requirements for animals, Wisconsin does something really interesting, and it sounds at first like it's really industry-friendly, but I'm going to argue to you that it has some leverage points that offer ways to get at the animal issues involved. In Wisconsin, it is, you cannot impose a shelter requirement more stringent than what is normally accept, an, an accepted animal husbandry practice for livestock in the county where the animal is housed. And this is fascinating. It is a county by county exemption. In practice, I suspect this was written with the notion that the industry would be the people setting those standards, and they could do what they want, I think it would be really interesting if there was a public awareness campaign that changed the way individual counties in Wisconsin thought about how livestock received shelter. Because as written, that doesn't actually put the power in the hands of the industry. It puts the power in potentially a relatively small amount of individuals who live within a particular county. We've talked a bit, a bit about mental state. I won't belabor that here. Suffice it to say that in order to prove your case, you can rely on inferences to demonstrate mental, mental state. Uh, for example, if you've got a defendant, if you've got a farm owner who has been farming for a long time, who's well-educated about farming, it should be fairly straightforward to demonstrate based on this that this is someone who knows that animals need food and water, otherwise they suffer and die. Uh, you will have defendants who claim they did not know. They, they were not acting recklessly or in a way that was anticipatable when they left their animals without sufficient food, water, or shelter. And you can answer that by relying on their own expressed qualifications. Uh, there's a lot of attention paid to holding different players within, different players within a factory farming model responsible. Uh, going up the corporate chain, going up the managerial chain. Uh, to be honest, this has some difficulties. Uh, 
what you're going to need to demonstrate first is that this is the cruelty that you're dealing with, the unlawful behavior you're dealing with, is the system at that institution working as intended. So either that the unlawful cruelty is part of the farm's plan, part of their business model, or that it is so widespread and so evident that they have implicitly condoned it by allowing it to happen. And that's not impossible. You can get there, but it's going to be difficult. Factory farms are not foolish. They will do things like put up signs saying, do not abuse animals, report animal abuse. And then they will rely on those to try to demonstrate that surely management, surely management did not know this was happening. Uh, so to get there, one of the things you may need to do and how you feel about this may be impacted by your feelings on larger criminal justice issues. You will need to, we will need to establish first that a criminal violation occurred because you can't impute a crime up the chain without having a crime in the first place. Odds are that crime is going to be imputed initially to a worker on the factory farm floor. Maybe you can flip that person. Maybe you can offer them a plea deal. There are a variety of techniques that are used in law enforcement all the time to get people higher up decision-making chains implicated in criminal activity, but you've got to start with the person committing the criminal act on the ground. So I'm going to wrap up by talking about some prosecutorial hurdles and how to overcome them. Uh, so you can see a brief list of some of the things that we're dealing with. Uh, and these all sound pretty intimidating. Uh, and I simply want to leave you with this, that there are ways to get around them. Now, if you're fortunate enough to be working with cow-friendly Batman, that's great. I'm sure Batman will have you covered. Uh, if you are working with cow-friendly Batman, I encourage you to have a good Section 1983 lawyer, because Batman does not care about your civil rights or those of defendants. Uh, but if you are not working, with Cal Friendly Batman, and you don't have to worry about those civil rights violations, there are things you can do. If you want to overcome statutory standards around, for example, what is appropriate animal husbandry practice, turn towards an expert veterinarian. Get a vet that focuses on those animals. We've discussed how you can infer mens rea from circumstantial evidence. If you're dealing with complex legal models, for example, moving up the chain to prosecute people in managerial positions, Turn towards established models where that works. Draw on your colleagues who do white collar crime prosecution. Because these are not revolutionary topics within the law, it is simply revolutionary to apply them to an agricultural context. Similarly, if our problem is that you have limited witnesses to what's happening in farms, well, first, that's one reason to oppose ag gag legislation. Um, but also bear in mind that anything that happens in an open field is not something people have a reasonable expectation of privacy regarding. And uh, so you can avoid a lot of search issues there. And finally, we often worry about potential jurors and how they're going to feel. Will jurors care about farmed animals? And it's true. Jurors are going to come into this with a wide range of attitudes about animals and a wide range of, of behaviors in terms of animal product consumption. But jurors, by and large, do not like seeing horrific acts happen to animals. And again, we've talked about this over yesterday's session in terms of how the industry hides what it's doing from consumers. When jurors witness abject cruelty, they tend to react negatively. So I would encourage you not to be too worried about the jury piece. One final thing that I want to be able to announce is uh, an initiative that the Animal Legal Defense Fund is embarking on we are producing farmed animal prosecution guides for each state in the nation. Illinois is first. We have some of those guides here. They literally came off the press two days ago. And our goal here is to summarize substantive issues of law, so answering what is a crime, to discuss procedural issues ranging from search and seizure, pretrial forfeiture, on through sentencing, and then to provide the full statutory texts. So if you are a prosecutor, if you're law enforcement and you're trying to get a quick handle on these issues, now you have a way to do that. We're going to make these available to law enforcement and prosecutors in hard copy and online. But if you would like to see some of them before then, please come up at the end, take a look. And finally, I want to recognize 
our criminal justice fellow at the Animal Legal Defense Fund, without whom this vast tome would not exist, Kathleen Wood. Excellent. And I have uh, indulged enough of John's time, so I'm going to get out of his way. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is John Hopkinson, um, and I just want to start by uh, saying that uh, it's an honor to be on a panel with both David and Diane. Um, like Diane mentioned, I'm based in uh, Portland, Oregon, but I did spend the first 25 years of my life in Chicago, um, which probably is not a surprise to anyone who's heard me say the word Chicago. Uh, but um, I, so I'm, I'm thrilled to be here talking to y'all today, but uh, especially to be in, in my hometown is, is really exciting for me. Um, I also want to give a quick disclaimer, like David said, I'm going to be talking about specific instances of animal cruelty and neglect. Um, I have some photographs and videos. Um, I specifically chose photographs um, that are not egregious. Um, I think everyone will be fine. Um, I'm maybe not the best barometer for normal sensibilities when it comes to sensitivities when it comes to cruelty and neglect, but I think we'll, we'll, we'll be all right. Um, so I just want to briefly uh, start by discussing the Oregon Humane Society just because it's a kind of a unique organization and describe what I did there because um, it, it frames the rest of my presentation. Um, so the Oregon Humane Society is a private nonprofit animal shelter. They do have um, in, uh, a law enforcement agency called the Investigations Department. Um, uh, so, like I said, they're, a, they're an uh, animal shelter with this law enforcement department. Um, they are the uh, largest single facility shelter on the West Coast. They adopt out more than 11,000 animals every year, um, and they are not affiliated with any local or, or state or national organization. And they're funded entirely by private donations. They don't receive any sort of tax dollars. Um, the in my time, at the uh, the three years that I spent at the Oregon Humane Society, they had police power that was commissioned by the Oregon State Police. So they employed special agents and humane investigators to investigate animal cruelty uh, cri and neglect crimes. Um, the special agents carried guns. They had police power. Uh, they had statewide jurisdiction um, so they can go all over the state um, and issue uh, misdemeanor and felony citations for just animal-related crimes. Um, it's all uh, citation in lieu of custody. They're not seizing people in custody and throwing them in dog runs at the shelter. Um, but they do issue misdemeanors and felonies. Um, you know, it, it, it is un really unique and it was super rewarding because I was able to either play a role or observe all aspects of our case from start to end. So I got to be on scene executing search warrants, uh, uh, you know, um, documenting and collecting evidence. I got to get my hands dirty, uh, take the animals out of their bad environments. Um, I got to observe them getting their, the medical treatment that they needed at the shelter. Um, and then once we got uh, possession, they were no longer in protective custody. I got to see them find their forever homes. So it was a really awesome and rewarding experience. Um, my role there was um, like acting as a liaison between our law enforcement department, OHS's law enforcement department, and prosecutors across the state. Um, you know, animal cruelty crimes are, are nuanced, and prosecuting them is, is nuanced, and it's not uh, pretty. It's not inherent to to prosecutors some of some of the complexities. So my role was is uh, us assisting them with that. Um, I would attend every criminal trial and I would pay attention to legal issues that arose during trial, and I would come back to our policies and our procedures, and I would look at how can we eliminate that from happening, happening again in the future. Um, when it couldn't be fixed on our end, um, I would go and uh, go through the legislative route and change the laws to make them less ambiguous or to make it easier for us to, to investigate and prosecute animal cruelty crimes. So 
What I'm going to talk about today is um, both of those things. Um, my legislative initiatives that um, we worked on at OHS, and then also um, I'm going to do a case study um, that kind of highlights some of the, the complexities that arise when you are uh, prosecuting um, a livestock case. Um, so I know that there's been a lot of discussion about legislation at the conference this year. I'm, I'm just going to kind of talk about a few um, things, you know, some overview things that I learned as a, you know, a baby-faced, pr uh, pretty green attorney um, just starting out uh, my, in my first legislative session. So um, I think having a lobbyist is, is crucial um, and, and very, very necessary. I think that they understand um, the culture. They understand strategy. They know when is it a good time to introduce something? Who should we have introduced something? Um, is this realistic? Um, when, when, with the timing, is it going to work? They know about what the funding is like, what the budget looks like, um, all those things that, like, I would have no idea. Um, you know, they, they, like, they, I remember our lobbyist was like, you have to eat lunch at this time at this place and, and be seen by these people. Like, that kind of stuff, I'm not going to know. Um, when you're looking at hiring a lobbyist, um, you know, obviously you want someone who's a zealous advocate for your mission. Um, that's, that's really crucial. I would say that another thing to think about is the client list of, of the lobbyists that you're looking at. Um, you know, people don't always remember where the money comes from, but they know who's giving them the money. And I think that if you hire a lobbyist that has a big client list and, and people that are big donors, they will, you know, associate you with that and not necessarily always remember where the money's coming from. So that's an important thing to think about that I think is, is really inherent. Um, explaining complicated legal processes. So it feels like you're talking to judges when you're testifying at work sessions and you're, you know, you're passionately advocating for change that you want to see in your state. It feels like you're at, in a courtroom and it feels like you're talking to judges, but um, they aren't, you know, they're not, a lot of them aren't lawyers. So um, sometimes you have to explain really complicated legal processes. I'm going to talk about pre-conviction forfeiture in a couple slides. Um, that was a really complicated process to explain to legislators. So I worked with our graphic designer and I had him create, you know, like a diagram that was basically like a schoolhouse rock, like, you know, this is what this means and here's some illustrations to walk you through it. Um, uh, I, Oregon is a very rural state. Um, there is a really strong coalition of organizations that don't want to see any movement. They have a vested interest in, in you know, the dial not moving anywhere. Um, even if it, like, clearly does not apply to livestock, has nothing to do with livestock, they're, they're going to be against it. Um, I, I definitely suggest um, meeting with the opposition ahead of time and saying, this is what we're planning on putting forward. Um, are there things that you have, like, a really big problem with? Uh, you know, doing this, the compromising, the the negotiating and, and seeing if you can come to, to a, um, you know, like a common ground and, and also just having a heads up of what you're going to have the most fierce opposition to is, is really valuable. And I think that Oregon um, for lawyers really encourages, I don't know about other states, but like with prosecutors and defense attorneys, there is a, a camaraderie and an a understanding um, that I think is unique to our, our state and our legal process. And um, that extends to legislation as well. Um, Um, so I'm going to start talking about specific examples. Um, so the first one, and then also the case, the case studies that inspired these cases or these this, uh, these uh, pieces of legislation. So um, citizens is the the scientific classification for uh, African parrots. So that's going to be pretty much like the most common type of exotic bird that you will see as as people uh, owning as pets. And in Oregon, that was. Um, included, there's there's um, a definition of livestock, and citizens is in that that definition. Um, our officers, um, this this OHS special agents and humane investigators, um, when they go out and respond, a lot of times, you know, this, there's a misconception that that the humane society just goes and takes your animals away. 
we want people to stay with their owners. The animals want to stay with their owners. We want to help people take the best care of their pets that they can. Um, and with domestic animals, you um, th um, the minimum standards of care are clearly laid out in, in the Oregon Revised Statutes. So when it's a, the problem with citizens and these parrots where people were having them like in the curlage, you know, on the curlage on their, their porch year round in Oregon, um, that's not ideal for an African parrot to, to you know, the, our winners aren't that bad, but you know, bad for African parrots. So being able to, our investigators being able to go and say, you need to do this, you need to do this, you need to do this um, in order to, to not be violating the law was, um, was really important. So, you know, our, our investigators go out, they're giving out shelters, they're giving out free food, they're giving out carriers to make sure that people can get their pets to uh, vet care. So, so being able for, um, for our investigators to go out and say, you, you know, here is this to help you and this is what you need to do. Um, you know, livestock is, is generally associated with the production of food or fiber or eggs or labor, and that's clearly not what no one was getting that from, from parrots in, in, in the state of Oregon. And, um, you know, the bond that people were having, you know, p these citizens are incredibly intelligent animals. They're interactive. They have long lifespans. P they're clearly pets, right? They're not, they're not livestock. Um, one of the, the cases that inspired this piece of legislation was um, a, a large bird rescue in Damascus, Oregon. Um, it was in a, a metal pole barn that had virtually no circulation. As you can see, the cages were stacked three to four high. There was fee, uh, food waste and feces overflowing from the cages onto the, uh, the top ones onto the ones below. Um, you know, the cages were really crowded. There was no perches. They didn't have fresh drinking water. Um, so OHS went in and seized 245 birds and um, one kinkajou. Um, so that's Ethan, the kinkajou. Um, Ethan is is um, pretty, if you don't know, kinkajous are primates. They're like, I think like uh, related to raccoons most closely. Um, this specific kinkajou was extremely aggressive. <laughs> Um, and very angry, um, but he was, um, his charge was interesting because it's the first time I think in Oregon, it's definitely the first time I ever saw it, but it was, um, his neglect charge was based on a lack of enrichment. So he didn't have medical issues. Um, he just did, had nothing in his cage. Um, it was just a bear cage, which is probably explains why he was so angry. So that was really exciting. Um, there was also African gray parrots, macaws, cockatoos, conures, doves, pigeons, Amazon parrots, finches, and parakeets. Um, many of them suffered from severe feather plucking, overgrown nails, and beaks, chronic stress. Um, so that, that's the, um, the kinkajou case. Um, cockfighting is uh, pretty prevalent in Oregon. Um, and I would say Washington as well, so at, um, the Pacific Northwest. Um, the nice thing about cockfighting, um, the, the nice thing about cockfighting legislation <laughs> um, is that um, there really isn't an op, there, there's no opposition to it from, from my experience, right? So no one's really jumping at the bit to say, no, like we should be cockfighting. You know, like there's, first of all, no legislator is going to do that. Um, but also I, I found that Farmers and ranchers like to separate themselves from these these negative perceptions of, of what they do So there was you know, like no one really cared that 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 we were pushing all this cockfighting legislation And it was unanimously voted um, when it when it hit the floor um, so the case um, that inspired uh, a lot of our legislation um, was uh, a Washington County which is um, right next to Portland. It's, uh, this, this took place in Hillsboro, which is a, a, a large suburb that's really close to Portland. This isn't like the middle of nowhere, Eastern Oregon. This is like right pretty much near Portland. Um, this involved a year long investigation into meth trafficking um, and cockfighting that culminated in the arrest of 30 people. Um, search warrants were executed on 18 different locations. Um, I was actually a student at the time of this, and I ditched my business administrations class to do this because, uh, uh, you know, I wasn't that interested in that class. But um, 
Anyway, we were told that there was a hundred birds, so we set up an emergency animal shelter. I could give like a like an, another hour long presentation on setting up emergency animal shelters, but um, we got there and there was more than sixteen hundred birds there. Um, they also found twenty six pounds of meth, which has a street value of like close to a million dollars. Um, there was ninety thousand dollars in cash, and there were nineteen firearms. Um, when I got there, the, the DEA, the, F, the FBI, and the Department of Homeland Security were also processing the scene. Um, so what ended up happening is we took um, 100 of, of the um, worst fighting roosters that had clearly been altered, their waddles and their combs had been cut off, um, and we took them as evidence and, and we moved them into our emergency animal shelter and actually someone called us to report our emergency animal shelter not knowing that they were like, I think there's a cockfighting operation going on. <laughs> um, and we're like, yep, we know. Uh, you know, they're roosters, they're loud in the morning. So um, we, you know, there, like I said, there were 1,600 birds there and we took 100. And there was so many leftover birds there, and, and the, the you know, people who owned the birds um, you know, weren't really eager to come back and, 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 and acknowledge that those were their birds. So we had to keep going back out to this property, oftentimes by ourselves, which was super unsafe, and take care of you know, over 1,500 birds. So um, the reason why we couldn't seize the rest of those birds is because you can only seize the instrumentalities of cockfighting, which were fighting roosters. So they're, you know, we were kind of, our hands were tied when it came to the hens and the chicks. Um, so what we did is we um, introduced um, the definition of source bird into the, the cockfighting um, statute. So um, the definition is uh, a hen used to produce one or more chicks intended for eventual use as fighting birds or a chick being reared with the intent that the chick eventually be used as a fighting bird or as a hen as described. Um, so that allows us to, to you know, uh, seize those, those uh, hens and, and chicks, the source birds. Um, 2017 saw more reports of cockfighting than the previous seven years. Um, and that motivated us to, to um, and, and like I said, there's a connection to other criminal activities. You know, there was all the meth, um, all the guns um, were also seized on scene. So it's, it's really, um, uh, and it usually involves crossing not only state lines, but, but US lines. So um, it's really important to, to um, address cockfighting for sure. Um, we also passed, um, there's an exclusion of specific instrumentalities. Um, uh, it, the cockfighting statute, for some reason, excluded the manufacture and sale of gaff slashers and other sharp implements designed to attach to a fighting bird. Um, so we, we got that eliminated. Again, there was, there's no pushback for that. Um, my next case involves possession ban. David um, briefly mentioned possession bans. Um, Possession bans are my favorite thing. I don't really, um, I mean, I shouldn't say I don't care about jail time, but I'm much more passionate about possession ban um, when it comes to sentencing. In Oregon, it's mandatory. Um, so if you're convicted of animal cruelty or neglect, um, you, you cannot possess domestic pets and any um, genus species of the animal victims in your case. So if that means that you're convicted of neglecting a horse, you can't have horses or dogs or cats or any other domestic pets. Um, there are a couple different ways in which cruelty and neglect become felony in the state, felonies in the, states of, in the state of Oregon. Um, one of them is uh, if it's done in front of a youth um, or a minor. The other way is if you have a previous conviction uh, involving uh, domestic um, related crimes like strangulation and things like that. Um, another way is um, if it's over a certain amount of animals, which is 10 or 11, depending on if it's abuse or neglect. Um, it's, was the possession ban extends to 15 years for felony abuse, but not felony neglect. Now the people that are committing felony neglect um, are uh, people living with the experience of hoarding or or puppy mills usually. Um, it's really important to get that 
that possession ban extended to 15 years for that those situations because with puppy mills they have the um facilities to just hit the ground running after five years they already have everything set up um people who are living with the experience of hoarding have an extremely high rate of recidivism for hoarding animals so it also needs to be 15 years for for that situation as well um jackson county this was a case um that was, you know, a puppy mill, uh, 51 dogs, 12 birds, 58 counts of, of felony neglect, and they only got five years. So um, this was our motivator for, for bumping that up to 15. Um, Pre-conviction forfeiture, like I mentioned earlier, um, is, is a, a, a kind of complicated, but it's a, a way to get possession of animals prior to the, the criminal disposition of the case. It's a civil matter. It's a lower burden of proof. Um, the reason why I want to talk about this is because um, it was received, it was actually voted into Oregon law by, by Oregonians, and it was um, really uh, contested. Um, they, uh, you know, the ranchers and, and farmers and ag people saw it as a um, slippery slope. Um, they kept saying, you know, like, I, I'm going to have one skinny horse and you're going to take all of our cattle. But, you know, it doesn't change the fact that you still need PC, right? They still, it, they still have notice. There's a hearing. It has no effect on the criminal trial. So, it, you know, this was, when we were talking about this, um, the way that the statute was written, it was slightly ambiguous so that judges were interpreting um, the, the statute as um, pertaining to only animals that were charged on and not all animals that were seized, which is really problematic because it eliminates the prosecutor's uh, ability to have discretion about which animals they're going to charge on. Some animals are more charismatic than others. Some exhibit the, the signs of injury much more than others. Um, I'm kind of running out of time here, so I'm, I'm going to um, go pretty quickly. <laughs> um, some unsuccessful legislation, dogs and truck beds. You can see this dog is pretty precariously perched on the, on the, on the truck bed of that car. This was unsuccessful. I was uh, accused of being completely out of touch with um, the majority of the state um, because farmers like to keep their dogs in their truck beds. Um, so this is a, just an example of... of um, you coming forward with the, all the logic and all the evidence and it just makes sense and it's so simple, but there's other politics at play that, that prevent it from happening. Um, I also really want to talk about animal abuse in the third degree. Um, there are three abuse statutes in, in Oregon. There's aggravated, which is maliciously kills or tortures. There's abuse one, which is serious physical injury. Um, and uh, two, which is intentionally, knowingly, or recklessly causes physical injury. So injury is an element to all those crimes. So you can see in this video, and, and just a heads up, this it's not bloody or violent, but um, this we get these kind of videos all the time from elevator footage. We get them from um, we get them from like this is a front yard camera. Um, and in this situation, when by the time that we responded, the dog wasn't showing any signs of in, 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 any signs of injury, and our hands were tied. So this is something that clearly should be, you know, con that constitutes animal abuse. Um, again, the livestock people shut it down because it was a, a slippery slope, and they're afraid. Even though good um, animal husbandry is is excluded from all of the abuse statutes in, in the state of Oregon. He later said that he did this because the, the, this is a husky puppy um, because it was eating grass. So, you know, this is shocking and this is something that, you know, obviously should be the crime of animal abuse. Um, it's miraculous that the dog did not suffer any injuries. You know, animals can't tell you who hurt them, they can't tell you how they hurt, they can't tell you where they hurt. Um, they have fur covering their entire bodies. You know, it's it's really hard to prove injury. So there really should be an animal abuse statue and, and we're gonna continue to, to, to try and push this legislation. Um, and it's, it's modeled exactly after the, the um, its child counterpart. Um, I just wanna briefly talk about a case. Um, 
sometimes it's really difficult to to get the uh, county sheriff's office and the and the uh, the DAs on board when you're when you're in a super rural county. Um, I interned for Compassion Over Killing before I worked at the Oregon Humane Society, and they had an uh, undercover investigator approach a DA with a case, and he actually went and charged her with animal cruelty for not stepping forward fast enough. So it was dismissed, obviously, but um, it effectively ruined her career as an undercover investigator because her mugshot was then posted everywhere. Um, other considerations when it comes to investigating um, livestock cases is um, or organic. So, you know, you can't neuter a dog that's in protective custody because you're altering the animal. Um, can you provide antibiotics to, to organic cattle that are neglected? You know, that it, it becomes a, a, a tricky subject. Um, experts, you want to get vet experts that are respected within the community but aren't owed money by, specifically by the defendant that creates issues. Um, both, were, both world animals, especially rabbits, can be really difficult because they're livestock but also kept as pets. Um, Holdner, this this is the the largest livestock case that I um, that I had. Um, just get my notes on that case. Um, this was a pretty brutal case. It was uh, nine days of testimony for fifteen of uh, the prosecution's witnesses. It took five hours for the jury to deliberate, and they came back unanimous guilty on all counts. Um, it was a three week trial. Um, I think my uh, the amount of counts got cut off there of, of charges, but um, anyway, this um, this case we actually unlike what I mentioned earlier, we actually had the backing of the community um, and and the cattlemen. Um, Sixteen counts of first degree, seventy nine counts of second degree neglect. Um, thank you. Um, we had the backing of the community because they wanted to separate themselves from the bad actors, um, and and, and um, they were 100% uh, supportive of the of the prosecution of this guy. Um, seizure in place is is also available in Oregon, but when you're thinking about that, it can, you know, you can be sending a message saying that these horses are so neglected to the point, but we're not going to move them. You know, it kind of diminishes um, your case. Also, identifying animals is really hard when you're dealing with um, large cases of, of livestock. I always take five pictures of, of animals, two from both sides, or one from each side, and one from the top, and one from the front, and one from the back. Um, there's there's uh, ways to identify livestock. Um, adhesive tags didn't, didn't work really well. Um, there's also like a chalk that you can use um, that works really well on horses. Um, so, so that's something to, to think about um, as well. Um, and then I, I included some body condition scoring sheets. They're incredibly important to show the amount of, of neglect when it comes to food. Um, and um, handlers, you have to get people who can handle animals that uh, will sign confidentiality. You have to get all their information so you can provide it to the DA to be witnesses. Um, and yeah, I think um, we have some time for questions. So um, thank you. Any questions? Bring us your questions. Right, we have a question. Excellent. Uh, I'll offer a comment and a question on uh, possession bans, and that is I think it's important to broaden the language to include no unsupervised contact, no training, no yep. care for, and so we've, we've had success doing that. But I, I'd love to hear from any of you about enforcement efforts, you know, res with respect to possession bans. How do you monitor that? Oh, I'm so glad you answered that question. And you can call me Nancy Drew because I like to spend my free time. If you have you been convicted of animal cruelty in the state of Oregon and you have any sort of social media presence, I am all over it. That's a, it's like what I do on my lunch break. And I screenshot and send it to DAs like all the time. It's like my favorite thing to do. Yep. <laughs> So yeah, it, it, you know, and the DA will enforce it. So yeah, so I I second your observation. Whoa, that was loud. I second your observation on possession needing bans needing to be more than just ownership. When I say possession ban, I mean effectively any custodial controlling contact with an animal. I don't care whether you technically put it in your best friend's name. You don't get to be around the animal. 
Um, and then the other piece in terms of enforcement is we do see nationwide a split between how easy it is to enforce when it's a probation condition and when it isn't. Probation conditions are easy because the PO can go on site at any time, find the animal, and best the person off probation. Uh, if it's not a probation condition, you rely on someone like John to be looking out for evidence of violation. We're advised the time's over. Can we do one quick last question? I'll truncate it because it's a whole can of worms. But we could also stay and talk with you about it. Okay. Afterwards, if something? you'd rather do that. Well, let's let's hear the question. And then okay. we can we can go. <laughs> so um, maybe there's a short answer, but I practice uh, police misconduct in animal law, and so where those two intersect is cops shooting dogs. Okay. Does that have any play with animal cruelty statutes, or are we so far behind with charging police officers who are shooting humans? That's, I'll talk with you about that later. Okay. If you wish, I'd be happy to, because I um, handled prosecutions of police. So. Diane is actually a national expert on the issue. She's mm -hmm. underselling herself. <laughs> Silly. Uh, well, if you're interested in looking at the prosecution guide, please come up. And if you Thank are you. involved in prosecution or law enforcement and you ever need help with these issues, please reach out to ALDF. This is what we do. Thank you.